And if you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Uh, we started about a month ago a series uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, but with an emphasis on where and how to see the gospel in some of these uh, famous stories. And so uh, we're going to be uh, now studying the Tower of Babel, which a little bit easier uh, as we only have nine verses here in comparison to five chapters like we did with Noah last week. But they are very important nine verses, as we'll get to. So God's Word says this, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language in the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. See, this story is significantly more important than its length suggests. In fact, I've always wanted to know more on how these nine verses gives us what we know of today in vastly different cultures and, and languages, something I love visiting and seeing differences and similarities when traveling. Uh, in it, we see a unified humanity using all of its resources to establish a city that is the exact opposite of what God intended when he created the world and commanded them to do. A couple quick disclaimers before we get into this text, though. First, this opening description of the whole earth having one language could indicate that this story or this present episode, that it is not possibly placed chronologically after the events in chapter 10, the genealogy, where it specifically says in that chapter, uh, nations and languages. Um, this incident or story, however, may have occurred during that broad period covered in that genealogy found in chapter 10, um, especially as it's linked to the naming of uh, Peleg in verse 25. But we don't know for sure, and I'm going to be honest, it is not all of that importance. Um, you see, even in the first couple chapters of Genesis, how timeline-wise, there were some things that God did, God created, and then a little bit later, it has a scenario from right before. Uh, it doesn't mess with anything of what we know and believe God's Word to be true of when it happened in that timeline. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to briefly mention and address is I know that there are some who will bring up this specific story and how there are other myths and ancient texts that are similar to this one. But just because it is similar to some of those, myth, those myths doesn't mean that the Bible or Christianity copied off it. In fact, that would be coming in with certain presuppositions going into this text. And if anything, it shows general revelation at a time where history was being passed orally and these truths were being passed in other false religions and myths. In fact, a historian by the name of Michael R. Ash had said this addressing that concern. After having examined hundreds of legends from all parts of the ancient world, all telling substantially the same story, I think that anyone would find it difficult in view of the evidence to deny that there was some common event behind them. It seems to have been a single event moreover. So last thing I want to kind of briefly share is this. Uh, we don't, unlike some of the other... Uh, text and some of the other sermons over this last month have any type of looming foreshadowing gospel passage, for example, in the fall, like Genesis 3.15. What we do have is a very similar 
hindrance to both receiving the gospel, but then also multiplying the Great Commission, which going into the first point, we start seeing. This is not something I really initially thought about when reading and studying this story in the past, but uh, especially over this last month, reading a couple different commentaries, seeing different views on it, uh, you can't but help to notice and see it. And the first thing that we see is in the first verse of Genesis chapter 11, going back to Genesis 9, and it's this, that there is disobedience here toward multiplication. Disobedience toward multiplication. Before we read and see verses 1 through 2, we see and hear what we covered with Noah last week, chapter 9, when Noah gets off the boat and they're going to be called and commissioned to repopulate the earth, a do-over of the cultural mandate that is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Again, this is a do-over of the cultural mandate we had read and studied before in Imago Day, but then also when reading about creation in Genesis 1.28. And now as the world is destroyed and judgment from God, and as Noah gets off that boat, he is, it says he, he, he made a covenant with Noah, and he said to his sons, now be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth again. Now we see in chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, the opposite. Verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Right away, upon first reading, you may not think anything is wrong here in these first two verses, but there was something wrong. God had said to fill the earth and they were supposed to spread out so that God's whole earth would be inhabited by people who called on the name of the Lord, but they were not spreading. Instead, it says here, they settled on a plain. They decided to stay put in this area, this location called Shinar, and instead they clustered together, finding security in their own numbers and decided to build a city in opposition to what God had told them to do. And they knew that they were being disobedient to his, to his command of multiplication. How do we know that? Well, look at verse 4. They said they were going to build this city, they were going to build that tower, unless we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They knew that they were disobedient to God in this command of multiplication. That's why when we ask, what's the big problem with sticking together? That doesn't sound like a big deal. Well, it was in this specific scenario because building this city and this tower, it was an expression of their contentment with their own world and unwillingness to wait for the city that God will bring and fill the earth like he commanded them to do. They did not want to venture forth and, and trust God to provide, to guide and preserve and keep them while they filled the earth, but instead wanted a permanent city for themselves. And at this time, in light of what God commanded them to settle and stay together, which was defiance and disobedience of God's clear instruction to fill the earth. Now you might ask, why would they be disobedient? Well, if I had to guess, it's some of the same reasons why we are disobedient to the Great Commission and to multiply ourselves. Where we long for security when we're surrounded by people who look and talk just like us. Perhaps they felt like they'd be much safer and less vulnerable living together in this city instead of being scattered out over the earth under this curse. And again, some of that is just as true for us. We know that there is a risk in multiplication. What God calls and commands for us to do and what is part of our mission statement as a church to make disciples who make disciples coming from the Great Commission, which it says, of all nations. We mentioned the similarities in our Imago Day series from Imago Day to Missio Day with the cultural mandate to the Great Commission. And similar to the people in Babel, we recognize safety in staying together, 
strength in some of those numbers instead of multiplying. I'm going to be honest. That same disobedience has prevented, at times, Christians and the church from multiplying, whether that be planning new churches, reaching the nations, or even something as simple as multiplying in small groups in that way. Because we want to be together with our own echo chamber, hearing the same things, being with the same people, instead of thinking what we can be able to do to spread. Those same reasons can prohibit us from doing what God has sent us to do, to take that risk. And beyond security, we also see in the next couple verses how they also desired significance. They didn't want to just stay together to try to be more safe, to go against what God had told them to spread out, but they desired significance. Look at the next two verses as we see a clear picture of idolatry and building their own kingdoms. Verse 3, And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Most say this one verse right here alone shows how they were being prideful and what they can create for getting that their original resources were coming from God in the first place. Verse 4, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Again, ending, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They're doing this because they don't want to have to, that to happen. So instead, they say, let us use and, and, and make these materials ourselves. Let us build this city, a tower that will reach to the heavens. Why? Let us make a name for ourselves. The very opposite of what we just got done singing. Saying, God, your name is worthy of praise. They are saying, let's make our name worthy of that praise. Now, this is, of course, what is most known of this text in this story. It's not the most popular story of Genesis in comparison to maybe creation in the fall and what we hit last week when it comes to Noah's Ark. But between Christians, we know, see, it is pretty popular, important. In fact, it hit the news. I don't know if you guys have saw this. It hit the news just uh, several months ago, back in November. Um, some of you guys, again, may have read or heard about this, but Ken Ham, uh, who's the Answers in Genesis founder, and who created the life-size replica of the Ark by the Creation Museum, he announced that he is going to be building a replica of this tower here. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of ironic, okay? <laughs> and this is why, because it's pretty much the absolute opposite of the Ark, where we learned last week the Ark is a metaphor to Jesus, to us, and where Noah was obedient in that building. Now we have a tower being built out of rebellion to God and that led to like worldwide calamity for doing it. And yes, he has a reason for it, but it just can't but help to seem a little ironic. And as this Reddit user even says, uh, you would think maybe is a Babylon B, B article, okay? Um, but there is rumor that it'll have a zip line on it, so that's kind of cool, okay? <laughs> but they wanted to be God. In the end, to show themselves, to be self-sufficient in what they can create, what they can work and do, and in that process, take over the glory that should be set aside for God alone. And again, church, this is one of the clearest, although I'm sure this sin was going on way beyond what happened here but this is one of the first, most clear, sure signs of the danger of what we all struggle with in idolatry and building our own little kingdoms and replacing what God should be on the throne of our very hearts and lives and all our attention, time, energy, resources going to who created us for him in the very first place, but instead gets replaced with whether it be ourselves or other good things that becomes God things in our lives. And we build a kingdom around. See, idolatry, as you can see from these two verses, are the most obvious sins of this text. And it's even a flashback to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, when Satan 
said to Adam and Eve and promised them, you will be like God. That's what he said. And they're still dealing with it in their hearts. Because as idolaters, we make a God out of our work, out of our imagination, even out of our creativity that should be something to glorify God. When we give our responsibilities, our work and our productivity, our gifts and creativity to ourselves to make a name. When we desire that autonomy and that independence and sovereignty outside of the Lord, we find a way to compete with the Lord. And Adam and Eve, those who were involved in building this Tower of Babel, you and I, listen, we were never meant to be the center of God's world. That although that can come from set times, churches and Christians, we aren't. He loves us. He desires for us to join him in mission and that relationship with him. But we're not the center of the world. God is. We don't have the wisdom, the righteousness, the authority, the pure love that God has. We don't have in his sovereignty the gravitational pull that is strong enough to keep everything in its very own right place to keep the world going. Heck, I can't even find my keys and wallet half the time in the morning. How am I supposed to think that I can be able to have any type of sovereign control, reign and rule in my own little kingdom that affects others? And know this. Right alongside our false worship comes false, build, false kingdom building. We create in our own world a kingdom where we're not God that we can rule in justice, righteously, what will be good like he does. In fact, F.S. Frick, in his commentary over this, said this story is an example of man's futile attempt to gain security apart from God through their city building. And it's why, even the point where, if you ever read the great classic, Paradise Lost, Lucifer says at one point, it is better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And we don't recognize that our own false kingdoms is hell. But we want to reign ourselves. Sometimes, again, to the difference of what it means to serve God and what we would be doing forever in heaven. And this is one of the clearest pictures of where our hearts are still attuned to, where we want to make a name for ourselves, where we want to build our own little false kingdoms because God is not ruling and reigning where he should be. But then we see in the last couple verses, verses 5 through 9 of Genesis 11, God's merciful intervention. Look at verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. This verse has two semi-mocking, sarcastic digs at those here in disobedience and in idolatry. Number one, its builders think that their temple tower will reach into the heavens, it says in the text. But look what he says in verse 5. God says it is so low that he has to descend from heaven just to see it. Two, we see as they're trying to be gods, you see God reminding them that they are just children of, what's that word there? Men. And when we just got done singing, I'm a child of God, you know and see if you've read the Bible, if you've been to church here, how often has Believers, we are adopted into his family. We are children of God. How much that's mentioned in here, it's pretty intentional that it says children of men right here. 
Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. In fact, as Sally Lloyd-Jones says in Jesus' Storybook Bible, one that we've encouraged many parents to read to their kids for devotionals and their family, she says this in recapping this moment. They were trying to live without God, but God knew that that wouldn't make them happy or safe or anything. If they kept on like this, they would only destroy themselves, and God loved them too much to let that happen, so he stopped their plans. Look at verse 7. He says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. It's interesting, this verse right here, because to its founders, to the people that were building this tower and this city for themselves, Babel actually meant gate or residence of the gods. But as we see here, it's paralleled to the Hebrew word that meant confused, babble of voices. And if you can just can picture what happened here. Like I mentioned last week when we tried to picture the horrid state of judgment with the flood. Can you imagine this scene? waking up one day and all of a sudden not understanding each other. Where they were unified in one voice for these sinful purposes, all of a sudden the language and cultural barriers that prevented them to move forward and go on. I can't but help when reading this to think of like the language and culture mishaps that has happened to me and certain mission trips. Think about my very first mission trip to Brazil when I was in high school and where you're trying to communicate to one another, but again, limited because of language barriers, Portuguese to English. And so like, you don't know what they're saying. You're saying yes, no, and I can't but help to like do like other signs with my hand to tell them yes, okay. And so I remember one time specifically going like this, okay, yes, okay, okay. And what Will McKinney does all the time, trying to trick you to see this like this, I found out later is the same symbol of flipping the bird in America, okay? And that's what happened, okay? Like that would be censored if we're in Brazil right now for doing that because what I thought was I was saying, yes, that's okay, it was flipping the bird. Talk about a language, cultural communication barrier, right? Uh, to the last time I was uh, not out of the country but, but, but with a mission trip out of the country, in uh, El Salvador, I remember Hannah Holden, who some of you guys may know, who was a Spanish interpreter on that trip, helped me out with this. I mentioned this actually in a sermon on a Sunday morning that I preached over there. But where I thought I was saying in El Salvador, I am embarrassed. She later revealed to me saying I was saying I am pregnant. Okay? <laughs> the, the word was similar in how I was saying it. Instead of saying I am embarrassed, I said I am pregnant, which Apple emojis has a sign for that now. Uh, but it did not translate well through that. I mean, this still happens. You don't have to go to another country to see the barrier. This happens here in America between the north and south, the, the east and west. I mean, even like Lexington, Kentucky and other cities in Kentucky, there are certain barriers, right? Confusion of like, that's what that means? Oh, that, that's what that means? And so out of this, we see that. And in God's mercy, even from that and what we have now today, he intervened. The people had been saying, come, let us make bricks. Come, let us build to heaven. Come, let us make a name for ourselves. Three times they said that specifically. And now the triune God in his counsel with himself says, come, let us go down. Repeating what he had said originally, what we saw in creation, he said, let us go and make people in our own image. Now, come let us go down 
where there were one people with one language, but God, who would divide them into many peoples to speak many different languages so that at this specific time they could not communicate with each other in order to make their God belittling global plans for their own glory. And again, take note in comparison to the judgment that we read about and studied last week with Noah, how we can't but help to notice his mercy here in limiting their progress, but also limiting the damage in comparison. And then verse at the very end of verse 9, it says, And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. And I can't but help when reading this last part of the text to see how in spite of their rebellion, the sovereign God fulfills his command that people will fill the earth. Whether or not they will listen, God was going to do this. I was reminded of this when on a Zoom call last week about our Ukraine trip, how his mission ensues, whether or not we can go there. In spite of disobedience here, God fulfills his command. So there's two big things to wrap this message up. I want us to see and understand. Now, going to the point of this series, not just reading through this amazing, beautiful book about our beginnings, but how the gospel comes into play here. First, we must know and see the similarities of Babel in the world today. And this is similar, whether we be prone to our very own hearts or to gain culture in the world around us, and everything from celebrity and fame, technology, and the very own false promises of utopia. First, when it comes to celebrity and fame, 14 years ago, a journalist wanted to understand our culture's love and obsession for fame, and he wrote a book about it entitled Fame Junkies, The Hidden Truths Behind America's Favorite Addiction. After years of this journalist following childhood celebrities, popular celebrities at that time, and even celebrities that were in retirement homes that wanted so bad to make it, but just for decades was in commercials and then found themselves in retirement homes saying that even at the age of like 80, how much they desired still that fame themselves. He set out to share it all in this book, not exactly in the most glamorizing light, hence the subtitle, America's Favorite Addiction. But after those years of research and interviews, and then a four-month book tour. When he went back to his humble life in New Mexico, where his wife, who was a former doctor, worked now with the Navajo for very little money and get no exposure, even going back to this life that he said is more idealistic, I guess you could say, than what he wrote about, he said, he couldn't but help to feel a sense of withdrawal and longing for that fame he got a little taste of that he was writing almost somewhat against. And he couldn't but help to think how ironic and scary that is, but how true it is that all of us has that same longing ourselves. Whether that's to be noticed for our accomplishments, wanting to emerge from the shadows of just being ordinary or unnoticed, somehow, some way, enjoy the spotlight, wanting to appear impressive, be remembered, be the envy of others, to feel that love, to be cherished and idolized in certain ways. And listen, way beyond what we think about when we hear fame and celebrity of Hollywood. I am not talking about that. I'm talking about in our very own lives, jobs, schools, on social media, even a small group of friends or one boy or girl that we want to get the attention of. We still today have the same problem that they did in Babel and wanting the wrong type of attention 
our names to be known, to receive the very own praise of our accomplishments and build our own little kingdom around it. Talked about this before, but it's wide to a certain degree. I'm so hesitant, although there is a need for it, but so hesitant when it comes to politics. Again, although there is a need and standing up for what aligns with Scripture, right, wrong, in so certain ways, I can't but help to think how so many, whether it be politicians or the people that are on the podcast, writing the articles that are doing so much for their own little kingdom and fame over whether or not they actually agree with what they're writing and speaking about. I mean, I noticed this just a year ago when the most famous right-wing female, probably, of today, where it kind of came out where she at one point was the main editor of a mostly liberal blog years ago. It was wiped off and everything, of course, but somehow, some way, some people were able to bring it up. And just as early as October 2015, this person that is known, probably the most famous of, again, right-wing politics and speaking out of that, had written just in 2015 how the Republican Tea Party is led by a mad hatter, that there should be full-scale investigation into their bat, beep, crazy antics, and that the good news is they'll probably all eventually die off peacefully in their sleep, we hope, and we can get right on with obvious social change beyond what this public Republican Party is doing and what needs to happen. And again, just five years ago writing this, and then thou being the face of it. Why? Because maybe wind was changing, you could be able to build your own little world there instead of, again, I don't know, can't judge hearts, but I can't but help to notice and say and think we are all prone to want to build our own little kingdoms. We see this in technology. The wrongs of Babel is such a temptation in technology for many, many reasons. And not to bash it, as I've said before, I believe it can be used as a great resource for anything and everything from what God had told us in, in the, the cultural mandate, creating culture, but also for mission when used in moderation and with pure motives, a heart centered around Christ. Oh, but how social media is such a large temptation to go after that recognition, to receive those likes, to compare and want to be what you see and scroll, or to have influence in some of the wrong ways and reasons. Or we can even have one influence what seems to come across as for the right reasons, an influence for Christ, but in our hearts we're creating our own kingdom from the connectivity that it gives us. Again, for sometimes wrong reasons instead of the right reasons. We see fringes in politics have intensified and multiplied because of the ability to connect over the internet and social media. To an article I read the other day on the metaverse. Some of you guys don't know what that is. Quick explainer. It's what they're saying is the future of technology and social media and everything else, where uh, Mark Zuckerberg, creator of Facebook, uh, is investing heavily into an online world where you can go anywhere, see anything, again, VR, and believing, thinking that this is going to replace a lot of in-person interaction. Which, again, I mean, certain things with that I think can be great, can be used for mission, can be used for good things, and can be entertaining to a certain degree. But, oh, again, how we are so tempted and the same problems of Babel as this article had said with that type of exposure. So that, in fact, the article said the metaverse will present us with the opportunity to experience glimpses of power only God has. The readiness of information will give us a glimpse of being omniscient. The ability to create worlds and identities will give us a glimpse of being omnipotent. The conquering of geographic boundaries will allow us to be wherever we want to be at any given time, approximating omnipresence. The breaking down of the space-time barriers as we're able to travel back in time through VR experiences will give us a glimpse of eternity, and it says, quote-unquote, our futuristic Tower of Babel is luring us in with promises of what only God can give us, limitlessness. 
but ultimately disciples of Jesus will need to resist by knowing and embracing God gives us limits. That we are to be a presence in our local communities focusing on sometimes slow incremental growth of systems and structures that leads to people's flourishing, both physical and virtual, and embracing the inc increasingly unfashionable phrase, I just don't know at times. Because our lives can manifest the truth that we cannot be everywhere and we cannot be everything. And listen, that is a gift from God that he is. To last of all, again, false promises of utopia. Where through certain ideologies, sometimes blind political allegiance, we are deceived under false promises of a utopia on this earth like Babel was trying to build. But church, no. Just like we have similarities in the world today, there's also a reversal of Babel in the message of the gospel. Specifically, with what we see at Pentecost and the hope and promise of a new heavens and earth. I want to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, when it comes to the Pentecost. Some of you guys are fairly familiar with it, but this is what we have recorded after Jesus, who was crucified, and therefore his disciples, who was in hiding, and then through the Holy Spirit comes and sends them out. And look what it specifically says in comparison to what we know and read about Babel. Chapter 2, verse 1, Acts says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, talking about the disciples, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, when we went through the book of 1 Corinthians, we got to the part of the gift of tongues. We had shared that there's different places in the text of different gifts of tongues. Some that was a heavenly language, some as a private prayer language. This is specifically the languages of other cultures, other people. Not any of those things. Look what it says, verse 5. Now there were dwelling, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and, and Medes and, and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Well, church, again, in comparison to what we just read from Genesis 11, this is what that means. It's an initial reversal of Babel, where God gives everyone understanding so that instead of God's mighty works being proclaimed in just one language, Hebrew, for example, they can be proclaimed in many languages. As Charles Wesley said in his great hymn of 1739, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. See, this shows the end in some ways of Babel and the beginning of a new humanity and creation given in the covenant fulfilled by Christ. Because instead of people climbing up to God, we now see that God comes down to us in Jesus, not in judgment, but for salvation. 
Instead of people gathering in one location to make their own name great, we now see a scattering all over the earth to make God's name great. Where instead of language being a barrier to man's mission of self-glorification, languages are now redeemed in order for the triune God's mission of glorifying himself to move forward and to multiply such people. See, the beauty of Pentecost is that God now wants to receive glory from all kinds of people. And to that end, he ensures that his gospel will be proclaimed in all kinds of languages. And it's easy to read verses 8 through 11 right there and to stumble over the tribes and the nations. We may think it's just a long list of obscure names, but listen, those are not obscure people to God. They're not unknown to him. He knows every one of them, just like he knows your nation, your city, your town, your neighborhood, and you. The Holy Spirit knows your dialect and he knows your heart and he speaks to ordinary people like you and I prompting us to share our faith, the gospel, reminding us of what Jesus taught us. Babel is no match for what Jesus brought in the gospel and we see here in Pentecost. With the nuances of thousands of languages are not enough to capture the glorious nature of salvation through Jesus Christ. And now in the Great Commission, we are to make disciples of all nations. And in the very end, when Jesus comes back, we see, we read in Revelation that people of all nations and all languages will be singing his praises and worshiping him. And I know we've read that, we've had sermons on that, what that'll be like. I can't but help to when reading the Tower of Babel, thinking how amazing it is to see how different languages and cultures as a result of our sin, yet God takes even the effects of that sin and redeems and transforms them into something that will give him praise both now and at the end of time. God is not going to destroy all languages. But instead, he sees the diversity of languages and cultures a part of the beauty of his creation. And every tongue, every tribe and nation will praise God. Those different languages, it won't go away. It's why I cringe to a certain degree when I hear in America, oh, you don't speak that language? You guys speak with us. Not new heavens and earth. Because they'll all be in service to praise King Jesus. It's amazing to consider how God will transform even the effects of sin of what we see here and put them in service to praising him. And so how do we respond? My prayer and hope is it's the same response that we see here in Acts 2 to the very same problems from Babel. Look what Verse 38 through 41 says, when they see this and they say, how is this happening? And then Peter preaches the very first Christian sermon, shares how in the gospel Jesus came as that fulfilled Messiah that the Jews looked forward to and that he did come and die on a cross for our sin, the sin that separates us from God and that causes that consequence of both spiritual and physical death, that he took our place in taking that sin, atoning, but then three days later, showing that he and only he has all the power, authority, to not only give us that same new life, but to forgive us of that sin. And that when we recognize out of his love and mercy, we need him. This is the only way we are made right with him, be given new life from him. We turn, repent of our sin, and have saving faith in him. And when Peter preaches this sermon to them, look at their response. 
Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort or encourage them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation so those who, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What should be our response to the same problems from Babel? My prayer and hope is that you will save, be saved from this crooked generation as we try to do the same things. That we repent of any type of disobedience and idolatry, that we believe in Jesus, receive his forgiveness, take steps of obedience. The example here being baptism, but that doesn't mean baptism for you. What do you be, need to be obedient in? Whether that be multiplication, sharing your faith, getting rid of certain sin. Take steps of obedience. And then notice what happens here. When they did this, 3,000 people were saved that day. Do you know what that's called? A certain math term, multiplication. Be ready and willing. When you get rid of those idols, smash them to the ground. Repent, restore to Christ, and be obedient to him. How? He will multiply us for the right reasons and for his name to be glorified and others to be saved. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for being a redemptive God that in spite of our similar struggles and our very own hearts when it comes to disobedience and idolatry, out of your great love and mercy for us, like you had for these people, you remind us that you desire for that repentance, that faith that leads to obedience and multiplication. Now, God, I can't again but help to think of it being missions month how tempting it is for us to again try to be our own little gods in our own little world and build those kingdoms and, and desire such recognition even when it looks all good on the outside what goes on in our hearts and how gracious and merciful you are with your words and these type of messages and so as we stand and we sing together as one body, found in you, we, we have a great hope and trust that you are our firm foundation, that it's being built on your name, being glorified in that foundation, not ours, and that we can build then with confidence. And that again, going into our mission as a church, you will be glorified, our neighbors will be loved, and we will continue to make disciples who make disciples. But I pray, Lord, that is on this foundation, not on any of ourselves or others. We can thank you for your word, and from it who you reveal your son, Jesus. In your name, as we respond in singing, prayer and repentance and faith.